I wasn't sure if I was going to do this as a comedic intro or not, so I'm just going to do the intro normally, but then add some funny music. Storyboarding. My role in the animation industry's most crucial ingredient. Okay, yeah, that was kind of silly. Am I using that? Yeah, I'm using that. Introduction. The very first animation ever made was dancing six people drawn against a chalkboard by hand. And since then... Yeah, nothing's really changed much. Just swap out chalkboard for high-tech computer and stick people for whatever you could possibly imagine. But at the base of it all is one thing. A traditional beginning. From concept to design to explanation. We've always had traditional means of telling stories in film, even if it's just in the pre-production, but despite our advancements, it still proves crucial to make anything for storytelling. Films, television, advertising, they all start with storyboards and get conceptualised by paper frame animation. That, my dear listener slash watcher, is where my role comes in. My role in storyboarding and traditional animation. Woo, yeah, that's what the film's about! Chapter 1. The Beginning of My Journey Initially, I came into this course wanting to be the person to revive traditional animation glory to Jess. But truthfully, it does not take much research to learn it's not actually dead. It's more like it's been beaten in a football game and instead took up gardening. Yeah, it's not the most popular kid in school anymore, but the team would be buggered without it. To clarify, by traditional animation, I just mean the paper cells. For all I'm a traditional artist lover, even I can agree hand-painting hundreds of thousands of animation cells is ludicrous. Fun fact, the original animators of Snow White pre-booked their hospital stays for when the film would be done. That is how grueling it was. Nowadays, plain paper animation is used for pre-production and, in a few rare cases, the actual aired product, with the colouring done digitally. Notable names like DreamWorks and Cartoon Saloon use paper animation to test the character movements, and in DreamWorks' case, animate most of the film with just paper before moving on to digital. In the case of cartoons like Steven Universe, Regular Show, We Bear Bears and Infinity Train, almost every single frame is drawn by hand and coloured with fill tools. A notable thing for these four cartoons is that they are WILDLY SUCCESSFUL! Chapter 2 Traditional animation and styles. I was able to grab an interview with Owen Dennis, a storyboard artist for Regular Show, and the creator of Infinity Train. My questions were mostly to do with storyboarding, but the answers to traditional animation were exceptional. I asked this question. Off topic from storyboarding, but I know Regular Show and Steven Universe animate their characters on paper cells. Can you say how common this type of animation is and what's required of animators in this medium? And from my response, I felt that these were the most important. I'm also going to butcher his accent. It's pretty common at Cartoon Network. I can't say how common it is at other studios. This was a little saddening to learn, but it certainly gave me an idea of what places to work towards. Namely the Burbank, California studio and Atlanta, Georgia... Georgia? America has interesting names. The United States studio. With Cartoon Network currently being the only studio still creating traditionally animated television cartoons, this also gives me a great chance to practice the appropriate styles to work towards. Styles such as these, in comparison to my own style, show in my ever so humble opinion, great potential. Cartoon Network likes to experiment with their shows of late, but generally keeps a base style they enjoy working with. I'm already heavily influenced by their cartoons in my work, and with a bit more practice, I could probably get the fluid movement they have and be unique enough to grab their attention. That being said, I can already see some issues. My style is very stretchy and wobbly, especially in animation. Cartoon Network boasts very beautiful cartoons with very solid animation, from their flash animation to their traditional work. I can get better with keeping solid, smoother forms. I've proven able to do it in the past, but it will take at least a couple years of solid practice to get there. Luckily, that's where storyboarding will have me safe. But we'll get to that later. Another very important part of the answer I was given in regards to traditional animation was this sentence. The first requirement is to have an understanding of motion and some animation training. The second 
if you want to animate for a big studio, you have to be a Korean animator living in Korea. I got a D in French, so hearing most of the animation is done in Korea? Yeah, not fun times. But there was a light at the end of the tunnel, in the form of a post on Darius' own personal blog. Not a stalker. Occasionally, not very often, but occasionally, when you're working in TV animation, you have a moment where you need a lot of control over the movement of a particular shot. In these cases, you might end up either animating something yourself or hiring someone local to do it for you because it's so specific. The post then goes on to show how he hired Rick F Wait. Familo. Uh, yeah, that's right. Whose credits include Rescuers Down Under, Aladdin, How to Train Your Dragon, and Box Trolls to animate the steward as she overtakes Tulip in his TV pilot Infinity Train. This I found interesting and promising. It hadn't occurred to me just how much animation was done overseas, but upon further research, it's close to most of it. Dennis went on to say, regular show does this, Adventure Time does this, and the only show I could find that does near most of its animation itself was Steven Universe. But one show does not a lifelong career make, sadly. So it was here I decided how vital it was to focus on storyboarding, with traditional animation just taking a minor backseat. Chapter 3. Storyboarding. The New York... New York Film Academy, what an interesting name, listed storyboarding as a very highly sought-after career for a couple of particular reasons. An obvious being its usefulness. It's applied to nearly every form of animation and motion picture, ranging from film to Broadway musicals. But another reason there needs to be so many storyboarders is it's considered the most bombarded part and busy part of the process. Having to work between directors and writers and producers with a very limited time frame and having to produce up to 200 drawings or more a day? Ha! I feel beyond at home in an environment like that, which is why I consider it to be the best branch to take. A storyboard artist must be able to produce work quickly and be able to take at directions and make changes. I have been storyboarding absentmindedly since I was about nine years old, drawing out the stories with my friends, drawing out the stories I would make on my own, or redrawing film trailers with my own characters. And the benefits don't stop there. With animated films, a storyboarding team works alongside multiple writers, often giving their own input and voicing the characters themselves in production. Bob Peterson actually did the storyboarding for Doug the Dog from Up, but he became his voice actor in the final product after giving so much life to the character. My own voice acting would prove a massively great asset, alongside my theatre training and general animation of my own personality. Anyone who knows me in real life knows exactly what I'm talking about. Not a single table is free of my dance moves. After all that, though, there's a second reason I'd prove a brilliant asset to the storyboarding teams. In television, cartoon industry, more often than not, the storyboarders also become the writers and developers, deciding the dialogue of the characters themselves. This is ever-present in Cartoon Network, once again made clear by Owen Dennis after our interview. The storyboarders both write and draw the show, though the script can only be written after the storyboarders have written and drawn the boards. This is relatively common around large studios of 11-minute shows, but once you get into 22-minute shows, it's all writer-based. At my current state of progress, the longest thing I've ever storyboarded is a six-minute video. Alongside improving my pencil animation, beginning to storyboard longer and longer content until I reach 11 minutes is not at all out of the question. If anything, it proves extremely beneficial to me. I know my own work style, and I like to see it progress as soon as I can. Faffing around with endless warm-up generally gets me unmotivated. But fast-moving work always keeps me captivated. With cartoons like Star vs. the Forces of Evil taking two years to create a single episode, it's up to the storyboarders to create the entire season years in advance. With that kind of speed, I could see myself working up to higher and higher levels of production. Another job for the storyboard artists in shorter projects, as Owen said, is that they are the writers, essentially. An idea is given to them, 
and they mold it into something that works with the characters that they've created. At my core, I tell stories. I have always been a storyteller and the character creator, long before I got into the design of it. My linguistic abilities, though above average in my opinion, are just not at the point where they can adapt to many styles as is required for TV and film. Why the hell else do you think I made this a video? Bonus points for individuality? Huh. The shows I find myself attracted to base their work around storyboarders being in direct charge of heavy content with the writers and make their mark on the characters' motives and personalities themselves that way. I love to be a writer, but unless I can learn to adapt my writing style to be more varied, I think storyboarding is the best way to get my mark out there to begin with. Being avidly absorbed in the lives of fictional characters and sussing out their personalities, reactions and backgrounds, all to understand their reaction of being given the wrong ice cream flavour, is a dream job. I'll happily take 12 hours a day of drawing storyboards if it means I get to spend my board meetings voicing and creating these worlds and characters. However, there was a hitch in this seemingly endless trickle of positivity. Positivity? That sounds like a flower. Positivity. The quality of the storyboards. I asked Owen how rough the storyboards can be, and this was his reply. That depends entirely on the show. I know, for example, that Family Guy, they want the storyboards so tight that it's every single post. Like, they'll draw every post perfectly on model for, like, every step across the room. It's super specific. On regular show, we care more about making the gesture is right. In follow-up to this, I also got an email response from James Lopez, a veteran animator and storyboarder of Disney. My question being, are traditional mediums still used in the storyboarding and designing process? His answer, Typically now we do everything digital. We use programs like Photoshop and Toon Boom and Storyboard Pro to create our storyboards. For design, most artists use Photoshop, but a few actually still paint with traditional materials. This is where my concern grew. To compare my storyboards to those done for the shows that inspire me, the difference in quality is staggering. The amount they fit into a single frame and with an 11 minute video taking up to five weeks to board, it seems the speed required to make work like this is lightning. No mistakes can be made lest you fall behind. On top of that, I can fully recognize my main weakness. Digital art. Chapter 4. Digital art. My skills of digital work are currently limited to MS Paint. And as James Lopez said, almost everyone uses a plethora of digital programs these days. I can fully see the benefit of doing so, though. The waste of paper disappears, they're much easier to edit and easier to transport from place to place. You cannot back up a paper frame if it gets lost or ruined. My bias towards digital art stems from a lack of confidence in my own tech skills, as I've always struggled to use computers. Which, given my generation, is kind of unheard of. An attitude like that will definitely be holding me back. So to conclude, as much as I'd love to stay faithful to traditional mediums, no one ever got anywhere by refusing to grow. I must learn to storyboard pro and Photoshop, as I develop my abilities into traditional means as well. While I was researching the use of traditional means in modern animation, I came across something fascinating. A little program called TV Paint. Oh. From the name, I assumed it was a colouring program, but to my delight, found it to be a piece of animation software that was designed to be similar to hand-drawn animation as possible. The program itself is used a tremendous amount in universities that specialise in animation like CalArts, which the US News and World Reports of 2013 ranked as the second best art school in the entirety of America. On a more studio-based note though, this program is also used extensively by twice nominated at the Academy Awards studio, Cartoon Saloon. This right here is a damn good reason to learn traditional medium. Digital medium. Cartoon Saloon is a very down-to-earth company, in contrast with the studios I've been following thus far, which were all about verbal storytelling and jokes. 
Cartoons Loom boasts a much more visual medium of storytelling, more to do with the expressions and pacing than dialogue. I am a character artist. I am not a background artist or an effects artist. And Cartoon Saloon does place a heavy amount of their skill into their beautiful backgrounds. But their films also boast characters of dozens of types. Same. You will never see the same person twice. Their writing and wonderful expression of movement with what looks at first to be a very stilted art style. Perhaps I would never be good enough to become a TV pay animator for this studio. But the effort of their pre-production... I could become a brilliant asset to the emotion behind these characters. Storyboarding allowed me to understand the character inside and out, to know their feelings and their motives, and provide the most raw feelings they could possibly hope to portray. Alongside the information from Cartoon Saloon's productions, I was lucky enough to grab an interview with a former student of this university who has gone on to specialize in TV paint. I asked her several questions as I wasn't sure if I would find another person to talk to me about this program. And Alexandra did not disappoint. Most of my questions revolved around just how similar TV paint was in comparison to the traditional animation, and her responses were very positive in those regards. Even in the digital section, as I do know Premiere and Photoshop on a basic level, and a two out of three is a pretty much a pass. One thing that really caught my eye, though, was her response to the sixth question I asked. Would TV Paint be a good storyboarding program? She responded, Good for drawing them and timing them, sure, but there isn't really a way of seeing the whole ensemble of pictures. I'd say it's much better for animatics. This might contradict the previous statements I've been making, but I see it as a wildly positive thing. In a lot of aspects of life, I have great trouble trying new things if they're 100% alien to me. I struggled immensely with 3D at Max because 3D is so different from 2D styles, I was dreadful on guitar because it's nothing like the drums, and I cannot make a good smoothie to save my life because in what way is fruit like a curry? But if something is even 10% similar to something I can already do, even if the rest is made up on Mars, I can still find myself very capable of learning it. My lack of digital work is a direct result of a computer being very different to a sheet of paper. I've just never been able to grab my head around it. Now back to Alexandra's response. TV paint is better for animatics than storyboards. I mentioned earlier that animatics are something I've been a nutter for for years. There's something I enjoy and find very easy to make. Even if they aren't on a professional level yet, they've proven my ability to perform with enthusiasm of a professional level. If that program can make animatics, then I can find a way to practice drawing in it. From there, I can make more storyboards. And from that, I can branch into different programs that also can create storyboards. And ipso fatso, boom, we have a brilliant gateway into the digital world. I also asked her what type of tablet she'd suggest for a program like this, to which she responded, a Cintiq 24 HD. It will just feel more like digital painting than drawing straight onto paper. Luckily, I used my savings last year to purchase a a 13 HD Cintiq in a sale, so it looks like it's going to be a good transaction for me. Unfortunately, the program does cost at current £1,130, but Alexandra pointed me in the direction of the student pack, which costs a much less soul-crossing £450. It's still a lot, but I asked her what the package was to get if you were a beginner, and she heavily suggested the student edition, saying, I'd highly recommend getting your version while you're a student. I didn't, and now I have to save up for the proper adult version. There's a pirated version of TV Paint 10, the previous installment, floating around the interwebs if you're into that. It's humbling to know that no matter what stage you are in the industry, you'll always be a cheap bugger. I better start having some bake sales to save up. Chapter 5 comics. Now, pondering all this is fine and dandy and Pringles, but that doesn't do me much favour if I can't get into the dang industry in the first place. Ah, the ever-elusive industry. Everyone has their own different advice on how to actually get started in it. Internships is one, and trust me, everyone and their grandma is applying at all times. 
Another is bribing the company you want to work with for free food in exchange for an interview. And yes, that does work. But I think Disney executives are having quite enough free lunches from aged professionals looking to work with them. One cheeky Nando's from a student is hardly going to get noticed. Freelancing with your own work is another thing. And yes, I already do this. Have years and years and it's paid off. But these things are something everyone does. There has to be something else that can be done to do both and learn and stand out. The pause of suspense is to reveal that yes, I have the answer. Comic books! I really wanted to be a comic book artist when I was younger, before I got into animation. And that desire never really went away. When I was interviewing Owen, I asked him what the Cartoon Network studios look for when hiring storyboarders. I expecting his answer to be something along the lines of, you know, good understanding of pacing or something. He responded quite differently. Most shows on Cartoon Network are board driven, which means the storyboarder has to be able to write as well as draw. Drawing in the style of a show is something that can be taught, but writing can't be. So I would say that they like to see that you can do both things, which is why you would end up seeing a lot of storyboarders who came from independent comics. A comic shows your, both your writing sensibilities and your drawing prowess. It's easy to flip through a comic book and much harder to sit down and watch an animation. After reading that, I sat down to think of a few comic book ideas I could do. And I had a semi-epiphany. A comic book is the unholy amalgamation of absolutely everything I want to do in animation. I want to tell my stories. I want to develop and show much of the characters. I want to work in a cartoon art style. I want to work in mostly dialogue and prefer to show the actions. I want to draw all the time and I want to be self-reliant. It turns out this is common. Comics are in their own niche. But more often than not, comic artists do go on to work in film and animation because comics really embody everything you need to know about storyboarding. You have to be good at pacing, you have to be good at able to show motion and show clearly what's happening to the characters. You have to be able to clearly show the motives and the reasons behind the characters' actions, be that through dialogue or through expressions and movement. Big comics from DC and Marvel are very hyper-detailed and realistic with detailed backgrounds, but indie comics range all over the bloody place. Habibi, Lumberjanes, the Adventure Time comics, they boast art styles and panels perfect for 11-minute storyboards. I was curious where I would be in five years and was jotting down a few generic ideas, mostly to do with storyboarding and everything, but I really doubt once I leave I'll swan over to Ireland and seduce Cartoon Saloon with the promise of homemade toffee and a good attitude. I believe from this research, in five years I'll have published at least two comic books, have improved my portfolio to include digital media alongside my traditional work. I'll have solid examples of my ability to write and stories alongside my illustrations and sketches. I'll have some work experience from smaller companies, be it unpaid or preferably paid under my belt, and a decent reputation to those I'll freelance for as hard-working, dedicated, and a bloody nutcase! Artists do tend to like nutcases. Just look at the people teaching us at this dang studio. To consummate on this odd piece of coursework... I flat out thought I was going to hate writing this. I am not the essay type. But I am so glad I did because I learned a hell of a lot more than I thought I was going to. Storyboarding may not be the glamorous artistic life I expect it to be from an art course, but I've realised after all this research and self-reflection, it's like a sponge cake. I like sponge cake. It's delicious. And for all in its own, it's a smidge bland. It's still good. I like it. But... Traditional animation, story writing, world building, character design, and development. All things that branch off storyboarding. They're like icing and jam and cream and pretty flowers made of sugar. All absolutely wonderful and great things I love, but on their own, pretty gross after a few bites. If I was just going to do one of these things, I'd realise I'd get sick of it, and something I love would be ruined. But... The storyboarding sponge cake accommodates all of these things. Sometimes one at a time, sometimes several at once, but no matter what combo, they all pair brilliantly with the cake. 
They enhance it, and the cake balances out the intenseness of the icing writing and the jammy world building. I haven't a flipping clue how life is going to play out, but at least I've learned a good deal on what sounds good. Be it advice from aged Disney animators, to Cartoon Network television show boarders, to recently graduated students. They all agree, and very well relate, to what I need to do. I should be a storyboarder, and let those passions complement when they're needed in my work. And because I think that's way too sappy an ending to leave on, I am going to dance around with the credits roll. Enjoy!